Hello everyone. This presentation is on the Canadian Shield, one of the regions of Canada. It is for Grade 5 Social Studies students of Alberta. Uh, this uh, presentation is a direct reading from the book Voices of Canada, People, Places and Possibilities, written by Donna M. Goodman, J. Craig Harding and Thomas A. Smith. I do not own the rights. This presentation was solely created to help students during this time of COVID. Even though the Canadian Shield is the largest region in Canada, it contains only 10% of Canada's population. This storehouse is rich with natural resources. The Canadian Shield has vast exposed areas of ancient rock. With much volcanic activity, this area used to be mountainous, but over time, glaciers, water and wind wore much of the mountains away. Instead, the region is made up of high, flat land called plateaus, which are surrounded by mountains or cliffs. Unfortunately, this region has only a very thin layer of soil or rock, which creates many difficulties. Muskeg. This region is home to many bogs called muskeg. Muskeg is swamp or bog formed from the buildup of moss, leaves and other plants. Canadian Shield has lots of waterways. Waterways are rivers and lakes that can be used by people as highways for travel. The waterways made traveling possible for First Nations people, Métis, explorers and traders. French and English explorers came to the region and mapped the many rivers and lakes and bays. Due to the large craters and gouges left by glaciers, water has been trapped above the rock base. Millions of lakes, ponds, streams show the direction the glaciers moved when looking high in the sky. The plethora of water passages offered fur traders easy access to transport their goods. The waterways also allowed for an easy source of power, hydroelectricity. Both the Hudson Bay and James Bay are the two largest bodies of water that freeze over. Many of the cities in this region began as fur trading posts. Due to it being difficult to build roads, some of these cities can only receive goods by air or rail. Hydroelectricity. Since the shield surrounds the Hudson Bay and there are many rivers in this area, a great deal of electricity is generated for Canadians as well as for our neighbors, the USA. Climate. The climate in this region varies greatly because it's so big. Due to the size of the region, it's broken into three climate zones, the Arctic, Boreal, and Laurentian. The Arctic zone is cold and dry all year, like you might assume. It has short summers and long, dark winters due to its location being so far north. The Boreal zone has long, cold winters with short, warm summers. Northern areas in this zone receive less precipitation than in the southern areas. Finally, the Laurentian zone receives large amounts of precipitation. The climate is similar to Alberta's with cold snowy winters, warm hot summers, and mild spring and fall temperatures. Vegetation. Due to the climate and lack of soil, the region has a very short growing season. The Laurentian zone does allow for a little long season, which allows the growth of blueberries and cranberries. Wild rice is also grown in parts of this region. The boreal forest has been used by the First Nations people for hundreds of years to hunt and build canoes, snowshoes and homes. Even today, it provides many jobs. The Canadian Shield has a strong forestry industry. Rich deposits of minerals. The Canadian Shield is rich in natural resources, including minerals, forests, and fresh water. Mining began in the region in the mid 19th century and was key to Canada's economic development. Various minerals and precious stones have been mined or continue to be mined in the Shield, including gold, silver, copper, zinc, nickel, iron, uranium, and diamonds. A wide range of wildlife calls the Canadian Shield home. Lakes and rivers in the south house a variety of fish species including trout, burbot, and northern pike. In addition to fish, 
Lakes are often spotted with a mix of waterfowl, including wood ducks, Canada geese, and American black ducks. Other birds include boreal owls, great horned owls, blue jays, and white-throated sparrows, while mammals include caribou, deer, wolves, lynx, moose, black bears, and beavers. Moving north into the tundra, wildlife, like vegetation, becomes increasingly sparse. Animals in the Arctic portion of the shield include polar bears, Arctic fox, Arctic hares, and snowy owls. Roots of the region. The woodland Cree, the Anishinaabe, and the Innu were the first people to live in this region. They depended on the animals, plants, and rivers. French and English fur traders came into the Canadian Shield region to trade with the First Nations. They set up trading posts, and many of these trading posts became larger communities. First Nations people continue to live in the region. Some live in First Nation communities, and some live in towns and cities. Descendants of the French, English, Métis, and other people also live in the region. This region has many valuable natural resources, such as lumber, water, and minerals. Many people work in forestry, mining, and hydroelectric industries too. The Woodland Cree, the Anishinaabe, and the Innu have always lived in the Canadian Shield. Traditionally, the Anishinaabe lived in the southern part of the Shield, around Lake Superior. The Woodland Cree lived in the more northern areas closer to Hudson Bay. The Innu lived in what is now Quebec and Labrador. There were also Inuit living on the northern coast of Labrador and Quebec. Connection to the land. The First Nations of the Shield region used all the resources of the land and followed the cycle of the seasons. In the spring and summer, the Woodland Cree and Anishinaabe fished and hunted ducks and geese using bows and arrows. They gathered berries and other plants. In the fall, they harvested wild rice. They also hunted animals such as deer, moose, caribou, and rabbits using snares, traps, and pens. The Innu traveled throughout their lands camping in the best hunting lands, often journeying further in search of caribou. They developed technology to travel in this northern environment. Birch bark canoes were used in the summer and snowshoes were used in winter. They also invented the toboggan, a long sled that carried their belongings. Why did other people come? In the last chapter, you read that French explorers and traders started settlements in the Great Lakes St. Lawrence lowlands. New settlers were interested in things that were unique to Canada. They were especially interested in animal furs. It is not surprising that French and English explorers such as Pierre de la Vendrie and David Thompson started coming to the Shield in the 1600s and 1700s. Merchants in England looked at maps and compared the latitudes of London and Hudson Bay. They assumed that the climate would be the same as England's climate, which is gentle and mild. So when the merchants sent men from England to the Shield region, they ordered the men to provide their own food by raising pigs and growing gardens. From what you know about the Shield, how easy do you think this was to do? Eager to expand the fur trade, explorers and traders soon started making their way west across the Canadian Shield. They traveled for hundreds of kilometers into what was for them an unknown wilderness. They encountered muskeg, dense forests, rivers with dangerous rapids and waterfalls, and many lakes. Insects were ferocious in the summer, and in winter the cold and, the cold and snow might stop travel entirely. It was only with the help of the First Nations that the French and English traders could survive their journeys across the land. What were the first jobs in the Shield? As Europeans explored the region, they found it ideal for obtaining furs. Explorers like Samuel de Champlain 
had already traded for furs with First Nations people in the Atlantic region. In the Shield, the fur trade would become an important industry for the next 200 years, until the late 1800s. The fur trade flourished in the Shield because abundant forests, rivers, and lakes were home to many fur-bearing animals. Cold winters meant animals grew thick fur coats. Beavers built dams and lived in one place, making them easy to catch. Waterways provided ways for trappers and traders to travel. Etienne Brulé Etienne Brulé, a French explorer, came to New France with Champlain. In 1610, Champlain sent Brulé to live with the Oanda. He hoped that Brulé would create a friendly relationship with them. Brulé learned their language and became a translator. By 1618, he was trading independently with the First Nations people and become the first Cour de Bois. From the Oanda, he learned how to survive on the land and use the waterways for travel. Cour de Bois is a French term meaning runners of the woods. When the Cour de Bois began working in the Shield region, they adapted to the environment. They learned how to survive on the land and change their clothing to suit their new way of life. Soon more men came to New France to work in the fur trade and they made their living as Cour de Bois. They became friends with the First Nations and explored on their own. They would load their canoes with goods from France, then travel north and west on the waterways. There, they met First Nation trappers and traded the items for furs. Once they returned to New France, they sold the furs and set out again. The Corps de Bois faced many challenges. Sore muscles and severe muscle injuries from carrying heavy packs during portages. Bites from mosquitoes, black flies and other insects. Intense heat and bitter cold. Dangerous rapids. No maps or compasses and traveling through First Nation lands, sometimes without a guide and sometimes without permission.